just like that, it's time again to usher in the new year. What better way to celebrate than to whip up a home-cooked meal for family and friends? If there is one New Year resolution I hope to keep, it is to cook more often and to try out unconventional recipes. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, like, yeah, we'll Perfect go for timing. Okay. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cheers. Cheers. I might as well get a hit start on New Year's Eve. Please help yourselves to the food. You might be thinking, what's so unconventional about the food I'm serving up today? Isn't this just wine? What wine is this? Yeah, it is a uh, quality wine. Pasta? What kind of pasta is this? Why don't you try? Well, these are new recipes. And cookies for dessert? Yeah, the cookies are good. Are they? Crumbly, yeah. I like it. So, nothing special, right? What if I told you this isn't wine? Interesting. What? These meatballs, they aren't made of meat. No. No way. What? And the pasta and cookies, let's just say they're not made from conventional flour. Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> in the season finale of White Matters, I find out what dinner will look like for all of us in the future. Am I the first one to be eating this kind of noodles in Singapore? The soy wave is what manufacturers discard. Yes. And if you would find it, hard to swallow. They look, smell, and taste like comfort food we know and love. But you might find the truth rather uncomfortable. This bowl of pasta is actually made of crickets, and so are the cookies. These juicy meatballs my friends sung their teeth into? Not meat, they're jackfruit. And this wine isn't fermented from grapes. It's made from Tofu waste water. Ooh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to drink it's really cool. I think there's alcohol in it. It is alcohol. It's like way like, it, it is, is alcohol. alcohol. So it's gone yeah, through the Yeah, because I'm because I'm feeling it. <laughs> yeah, the meatball. Do you think it could have passed off as meat? Did you think yeah. it was made of meat? No, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Definitely could have. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. Oh. Could you taste jackfruit? I couldn't no. taste right? jackfruit at all. No, I could not. Couldn't yeah. taste it at all. Alright, how about the, the pasta and cookies? The flour used to make the pasta yeah. and cookies was from cricket. Cricket flour. I think crickets are not so bad. If it was cockroaches, Mm. I feel like it may be a different story. Dirty. You, you think of it as yeah. dirty, yeah. Yeah, like hygienic. Whereas like crickets are just in the grass hopping around. Yep. My parents are the ones who made me eat cricket actually. <laughs> oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> my friends were more receptive than I thought, which means they're not going to go hungry in the future. So why on earth are we looking at bugs, algae, and even trash for food? Well, over the next 30 years, the world population is expected to expand by 2 billion to a whopping 9.8 billion. And by that time, global food demand is expected to shoot up by 70%. How on earth are we going to produce enough food? The kitchen is not where you will find the answer. So out of all the dishes I prepared, four of them have something in common. What is it? They were made of ingredients that came not from a farm, but a lab. Welcome to the place where food meets technology. This is the Food Science and Technology Lab at Nanyang Technological University, where I'm meeting Professor William Chen. He is the go-to person for all things food technology in Singapore. What I gather is that our food system is not sustainable. So how do we innovate? 
I think one way is to make our food system more efficient. First, by looking into more variety of crops uh, which are naturally occurring. The second one is that uh, we will shorten or create a better distribution chain, supply chain, uh, through which uh, we actually minimize the uh, waste generation, take value out of this uh, waste that they generate, and reconnect back to the food chain. So we build this uh, more efficient food system, and then if we can actually propagate to the region of the world, and, and there will be less uh, worry about this uh, uh, food the supply, uh, whether we have a sufficient food to feed the population. The industry ripe for disruption? Meat. Meat has a much higher energy footprint than any other food. For example, to produce one calorie of protein from beef, it takes 54 calories of fossil fuel, making it one of the least efficient ways of food production. In comparison, one calorie of protein from corn requires only two to three calories of fuel. So in addition to what we have now, yeah. we should look uh, towards alternative food sources. Yes, we have been reading in the media a lot about all these uh, high technology-driven food source, for example, plant-based burger or lab meat. I see them as a very uh, innovative uh, uh, solution. If we look beyond Singapore at a larger scale, there are naturally available food sources which are underexplored. Like for example, insect protein. So do you foresee our future food and all these alternative food sources originate from the lab? Lab food, technology food, should be an option. But we should not see all these new development as a total replacement in our diet. So I see a wider variety, the better. You know that this is the industry of the future when people with deep pockets start putting their money where their mouths are, literally. In 2018, venture capitalists poured almost 17 billion US dollars into agri-food tech companies globally, a jump of more than 40% from the year before and more than six-fold since 2012. Angling for a slice of that pie? Singapore. I'm at Innovate360, the freshly minted food startup incubator located west of the city. This six-storey facility, the size of two football fields, is where food entrepreneurs can find help, from funding to lab equipment. My guide today is founder John Chang. He matches food entrepreneurs here with mentors and industry insiders. You mentioned Singapore. Agriculture probably doesn't come to the forefront of people's consciousness. Why is it suddenly Singapore is the hub for all this? So I think one of the reasons is also the realization that food is is uh, you know is a scarce resource, mm -hmm. and eventually uh, you know UN predicts that by 2050 there'll be more population mm -hmm. but not enough food based on our current standards mm -hmm. to sustain that population. So it, it would become a food security issue. Mm. And that's why Singapore's government is also taking a stance on that. You know, we'd be self-reliant on food mm -hmm. uh, by that time it comes. Yeah. Singapore currently imports 90% of our food from all around the world. This means our food supply is at the mercy of transport disruptions, political developments, or even policy changes in other countries. This explains the government's 30-30 drive to grow 30% of our own food by 2030. They've pledged 106 million US dollars to food research and development. That is serious money. Which makes me wonder, are we seeing any serious results? In the US, they have the Impossible Burger, um, lab grown meat, stuff like that. Like, what can Singapore produce? What is the Singaporean product that can come out of all this? Actually, you'll be surprised. In Singapore, we have shop meat, which is basically a lab grown shrimp. So they grow their shrimps in the lab without having to farm anymore. So what that does is really about sustainability. You don't need so much land, space, or water in that and water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just need a, a little factory with, uh, and, and you grow your little prawns and maybe even without allergens. Uh -huh. um, 
with lesser color, uh, cholesterol as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have another startup that is in the manufacture of milk in the lab. You don't need animals for milk now? You don't need to have cows anymore. Huh. <laughs> I was dying to taste them. But sadly, they're still very much in the secretive research and development stage. Those are the more deep tech kind of companies. But of course, for example, we have one in rice. They basically grow low GI rice. Diabetics can also eat. And then uh, we have also Aquaculture, a company that basically does vertical fish farming. And in Singapore, lands gas place, they're actually farming their fish in containers and building upwards. But what's so special about the technology is how they feed the fish. A cheap fish, they make it taste like unagi. So all these foods sound really exciting, but what makes you so sure that people, especially our Singaporeans, are going to eat them? I guess when we invest, uh, we look at how this food tastes like. Uh, it's really the taste that actually gets us interested in investing in these startups. You know, everybody judges the food by taste. But taste aside, is making food in the lab a good idea for the planet or even our health? Plant-based protein is having a moment. Changing taste, growing global trend towards plant-based meat alternatives. Companies are racing to bring meat-free alternatives to our dining tables. I really do like my meat, which is why my producer has decided to put me through a taste test. Well done. I would not have been able to tell. The texture is so yummy. This, this really tastes yeah, like a, like a think, meat. We would, we would want With cattle farming long held as a major carbon emitter, food companies are hailing their meat substitutes as having a lower carbon footprint. But scientists are sceptical. They point out, while beef has nine times the carbon footprint of plant-based meat, the plant-based meat are no better than chicken, which in turn have five times the emissions of legumes and vegetables. Is a better alternative on the horizon? What we're looking at could possibly be the future of food. The humble cricket. In Vietnam, Thailand and Cambodia, some insects are considered food. But in Singapore, they are regarded as pests. I'm with Ravi Shankar and he wants to change your mind. Why did you choose to turn to this uh, crickets as a source of protein? I was exploring plant-based options, but plant-based options did not just uh, come across as being very environmentally sustainable. Plant-based options actually have to go through a very extensive uh, processing in terms of isolating the protein so that it is high enough for us to consume and uh, fulfill our nutritious needs. While the rest of the plants is either uh, put back into the system as feed to other animals mm -hmm. or they end up in landfills. Mm -hmm. So for me, I wanted something that was more environmentally sustainable, mm -hmm. right? And that's when I came across uh, insects. So if you see insects, uh, they are actually very nutrient dense and I can claim that they are more nutrient dense than any other plant or animal based product. Crickets are Ravi's insect of choice because they multiply quickly, are toxin free and already consumed in some parts of the world. In 2017, Ravi and his friend Yuvanesh Tamil Selvan co-founded Asia Insect Farm Solutions and built cricket farms across Malaysia, Indonesia and Thailand. Their startup powderizes crickets into flour. So this is not your production facility, right? That's yeah. right. This is just a, a farm where they produce crickets mainly for feed. Uh, why couldn't we go and visit you? Insects, especially for food applications, is still a pretty much an emerging industry. Many of the things that we do there are proprietary to our company. So, so like top secret kind of thing. I wouldn't say top secret. <laughs> so it's not like because there's like insect cruelty going on, right? I'm not really, kidding. not really. I'm kidding. In fact, I think uh, insects, how we actually process them from uh, the live form to flour mm. is more humane than what most animals are processed. Once they reach a certain size, we put them in the refrigerator where they go into a deep sleep. For us, uh, we find crickets are actually a source of animal protein 
that are actually very nutrient dense and also do not go through the same levels of cruelty that the animal protein industries are associated with. That's not all. Farming crickets is also kinder to the environment. When it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, beef is the worst offender, producing up to 2,850 grams per one kilogram of protein. Pork is next, 1,130. Chicken, 300. And crickets, only one gram of greenhouse gas emissions per one kilogram of protein. Crickets, they are not like cows and chickens and pigs where they need to eat the food to maintain their body temperature. So they're very efficient in converting the feed that they eat mm -hmm. into body and muscle mass. So for example, 2 kg of feed that is consumed by the cricket contributes to 1 kg of body mass that is built. That's very efficient. And you also will see that there is no water source inside these enclosures mm -hmm. because cricket do not need to consume water externally. All the water that they need is actually obtained from their feed diet. In terms of land space, about uh, one square meter is able to produce about 10 kg of crickets. So how do you turn these guys into a flower? So once they have achieved a, a certain level of growth that we need, that's when we actually pack them in the freezer for them to be uh, going into this state of deep sleep, mm -hmm. right? And then once they're ready, we put them through a heating process, dehydrates them, and at the same time, it kills any bacteria that may be present. We then put them through a grinding process to achieve this flour-like texture. And, then, and this is the result? Exactly, So from yes. this, into this? Right. In this packet, how much uh, protein is there? So in this 100 grams pack, it has approximately 70 grams of protein. Wow! By comparison, a beef which is known to be a good source of protein mm -hmm. delivers about 33 grams of protein by 100 grams. So you can see the comparison between uh, beef and crickets, mm -hmm. why crickets are naturally much more nutritious in terms of protein. But other than that, they also deliver a full essential amino acids that we need. Humans need about 20 amino acids in general, mm -hmm. but nine of it cannot be produced naturally by our body. So crickets actually delivers all nine that we need. It looks like pepper, finely yeah. ground pepper. Maybe you can actually open it up to take a smell. Are you serious? To see what you think of uh, this product. Because a lot of people feel okay. that crickets are very bad smelling or very bad tasting, right? Yeah. Okay. So just to get first opinion on what you think of the smell of this. Okay. It's not very heavy smelling, it's not pungent at all. Um, but neither is it like, there's not a like huge fragrance to it. It's actually quite a neutral, mild fragrance. Yeah. So the thing is that uh, when we actually started farming crickets, we actually got uh, something that didn't smell as good as this, oh. right? So again, uh, what we feed the crickets, how we process them, eventually goes into how the crickets smell and taste. So that when it is added into uh, existing food formulations and recipes, consumers will not be able to detect a very distinct difference in flavour or taste, mm -hmm. right? Because we want consumers to be getting a higher level of nutrition, mm -hmm. but at the same time enjoying the taste that they are familiar with. The idea is to create a versatile product that could work well with any flour-based recipe, such as pizza and cookies. But will people actually want to eat this? What do you think are the challenges that you are going to face in terms of uh, selling or marketing this product? For most people, when we tell them that the products that they consume uh, contain crickets, right? Immediately, uh, some of them might have the, the yuck factor. How we actually try to tackle this is to not focus so much on the fact that the product contains crickets. For most people, uh, making food choices is more emotive than rational. Some people actually choose a food product based on how it looks, but most of us choose a food product based on how it tastes. So we are going to focus on creating tasty food products that people can get on board with, and then that's when we raise the awareness that these products that taste so good are also very good for your body because they are highly nutrient dense, and they are also very good for the environment mm. because they are made using uh, very sustainable ingredients. By focusing on taste first, we are helping consumers uh, overcome the fear factor. I'm having myself a cookie made with cricket flour. Never did I imagine in my life I'll be eating something made of crickets. It tastes pretty good. I guess I can be converted. Just when I thought what's for dinner in the future couldn't get any weirder, my producer tells me Josh, ready to eat some algae? What? 
I know what you're thinking. Joshua, this isn't food. It looks like grime that grows on fish tanks. Meet Ricky Lin, the man who came up with Singapore's first microalgae protein. He hopes you'd reconsider. Back in 2015, he created Vigo Patty, a meat-like plant-based protein. But before commercializing it, he's moved on. Well, your focus was in plant-based research, right? And then you moved on to micro plants or microalgae research. Like, what, what was the cause for the shift? Honestly, there, there isn't any shift. Uh, it's all part of the plant protein research. So microalgae is considered plant protein as well. It is quite uh, logical and sensible to have a alternative protein source on microalgae to be grown in Singapore because we can't rely on imported uh, legumes or plants into Singapore. The fancy, high-tech looking equipment is called a photobioreactor. It's used to grow and harvest microalgae, single-cell organisms that live in water. What you see here that is being suspended are the wet biomass, and these are all microalgae. What we'll do is to harvest all this uh, wet biomass microalgae to be then processed into our food raw material later on. I want to translate this into like a dish on my plate. What can I see on my plate from this one tube of microalgae? Oh wow, uh, there will be quite a lot because it's not uh, just having that biomass, but it's also having other ingredients in the food formulation itself. Basically, with the 5 to 10 grams of the microalgae that's being harvested, if we are able to formulate uh, food using maybe 30% uh, of microalgae as a raw ingredient, then I would say that easily, maybe about 30 grams is good enough for per portion of serving. It really depends on what we use the algae for. Exactly. Microalgae require just one-tenth of the space to reproduce compared to plants, and they grow up to 20 times faster. Once in a bioreactor, controlled conditions induce photosynthesis, prompting the cells to split and multiply. The resulting organic material is then dried into a powder, which can be added to flour-based ingredients like this. And of course, I asked to try the noodles. Am I the first one to be eating this kind of noodles in Singapore? I would say that you are the first uh, external guest to have uh, tasted our product. It reminds me of cha chiang mian. I'm really interested in this, the noodles. Look at this, it reminds me of cha soba, like green soba. Tastes like noodles, like very tasty noodles. There's a nice bite to it as well, very light. And I'm going back for more. <laughs> it tastes really good. But, but do you think that the everyday Singaporean will find it difficult to accept food made from microalgae? The first thought that comes to the mind is microalgae is usually the grime that you see, you know, mm, in the your fish tank, fish tank yeah. you know, right? Things like that. If you would allow me to just bring you back, you know, a few thousand years ago, humans have really been eating algae products. Look at seaweed, for example. So they are considered and classified as a macroalgae. Whereas uh, anything that is smaller in size, you know, these microorganisms are classified as microalgae. So there's a perception that we think it's dirty, but like you said, it's actually just micro seaweed. All living things at the cellular level, they are pretty much the same. We eat animals that are caught in the wild, for example fish, and the fish will feed on this microorganism. So why not we go direct to the food chain itself at the base level. So I've learned that microalgae and crickets are extremely efficient alternative sources of protein, which require way fewer resources to produce. Seems like a good enough reason to go meatless, well, or at least less meat. But enough food for now. I'm a little thirsty. Can someone get me a glass of... What? I just went on a culinary tour around Singapore unlike any other. It reminds me of cha mian. I'm having myself a cookie made with cricket flour. So insects and microalgae could all be making their way into my stomach very soon. 
Time to wash down all that food with a drink. But having been on this journey, this is probably not what I think it is. This glass of white wine-like beverage is courtesy of Chua Tianyong, a PhD student from the National University of Singapore. Do you want to have a guess like what is this made from? Oh, even though it looks like it and it kind of tastes like it, I know that this is probably not made of grapes. Maybe a uh, different fruit? Um, star fruit. What if I tell you it's not, it's not made from fruit? Uh, and what else could you make wine with? Uh, uh, rice? There's, there's, there's rice wine, there's a... Uh, is it rice? Oh, it's not rice. Um, the answer's right in front of me, it's here. Is this it's soybean? Yes. Whoa! This wine tasting drink is from soybean. This is the first time I've heard of an alcoholic beverage made from soy. But that's not what makes this drink special. The base ingredient actually comes from soybean, but okay. we don't use soybeans specifically just to create this drink. What kind of indirect thing is you? Okay, so during the tofu production, two byproducts are generated: soy okara or the soybean pulp. The second byproduct is called the soy whey, a liquid byproduct from tofu production. Soy whey itself is actually a byproduct that is commonly thrown off by the tofu manufacturers after it is generated. So what we are doing over here is that take the soy whey and convert it into alcoholic beverage that you are tasting over here. Wait, wait, let me get this straight. The 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 soy whey is what? tofu manufacturers discard. Yes. So you're telling me I've been drinking soybean or tofu waste water? Uh, I won't call it a waste water. All consumers, we don't like to hear the word waste in our food. I'll okay. call it a byproduct. It sounds nicer. Well, whatever he calls it, Tianyong's brainchild is part of a new tech wave, turning food waste into desirable food. Considering that Singapore threw away over 630,000 tonnes of food waste in 2018, it's an idea that could reduce our reliance on imported food. Tianyong agrees to show me how his drink, which he calls Sachi, is made. So we'll now blend the soybean together with water to give you a slurry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once we have the slurry, we'll have to filter it to give you the soy milk. And what is remaining in the cheesecloth is the soybean pulp or the okara. This is one of the two byproducts. Correct. But we won't be using okara. Mm -hmm. yeah, what we'll be using is the soy milk over here. So okay. after boiling, the flavour will change. So we're going to boil it now? Yeah, we're going to boil it now. Okay. Now, um, we'll add in the coagulants. We add that to coagulate the soy milk. And yeah. I need to just swap. Soy proteins will start to coagulate together. So you'll start to feel resistance. Oh yeah, a little bit. Swirl. Yeah, it feels a bit different now. We turn the milk into tofu. Yes. Sedimentation will take about 15 minutes to mm -hmm. settle. You can start to see the whey and the tofu start to separate. So what we are doing now is to pour the coagulated tofu in the cheesecloth. The yellow liquid is actually the whey. Mm -hmm. And now it's the tofu coming out. So right now it's very chunky. So mm. after you press, you have the firm piece of tofu. So the liquid over here will be the starting ingredient for the alcoholic beverage that we will be creating. This is what we are doing in the lab. But if we are collecting from commercial tofu producers, we actually will skip all these processes mm -hmm. at the start. Just get the soy whey Correct. immediately and then work on that, right? Yes, because all the labor-intensive work is being done by the tofu manufacturers. Mm -hmm. For us, we just collect the byproducts and convert it into the alcoholic beverage. Soy whey itself actually contains nutrients. So if you actually dispose soy whey into the drainage without any processing, it can result in water pollution in the long run. If it's not utilised, then you need to spend energy and resources to, to process the soy whey before disposal. Yes, why not convert this byproduct into a consumer beverage? Okay, just looking at the colour, it's uh, quite similar to the sachi that, that, that you've made. Correct. Yeah, it just smells like soybean milk. Uh, okay, let's have a taste. Yep, go ahead. It tastes like very unsatisfying soy milk. You know, there's no body, there's you know, there's no not much taste actually. Correct. That's why um, tofu producers are now discarding this as a byproduct. Okay, but to you, this is your source material. Yes. This is your goal. This is my goal. <laughs> this is my goal mine. So after we have the soy whey, we now have to add sugar and acid to adjust the whey before we start the fermentation process. We will add the acid in first, fruit acid, commonly found in um, beverages. Then after that, we will have the sugar. Well, what does this do to the whey? For the acid, create an optimum condition for the yeast to grow. Sugar is provide the yeast carbohydrate sources for the alcohol production, as well as to provide nutrients for the yeast to grow. So we will mix the ingredient well, then after that, we will pour into the bottles to do the pasteurization. 
So right now, we'll place these two bottles into the water bath to do the pressurization process. The water is already heated up to 60 degrees Celsius. Then we just put the bottles in. Then we just let it sit for about 30 to 40 minutes. We just have a glass of sachi first while we wait for this. Yeah. <laughs> So after we pasteurize the whey, then now we'll do the inoculation of the yeast. Inoculation? Introducing the yeast? Yeah, introducing the yeast into it. Clean environment, is it? Clean environment mm -hmm. to reduce the risk of contamination. And it's a specific amount of the yeast, right? Yes, correct. We actually calculated um, like the amount of yeast to be introduced into each bottle. Okay. So after we inoculate the yeast, we'll now put the, these two bottles into the incubator for the fermentation to kickstart. Okay. So after the fermentation process, we now need to centrifuge the yeast away from the product that you want. After you centrifuge our product, you will become a clear product as you can see over here. So this is what I drank? Yeah, the alcohol percentage for this drink is about 7%, which is similar to Moscato. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so that's how you sell it to your customers? So this is our end product. Wow, looks beautiful. Sachi. Yeah. You have a nice sticker and all. Nice. Okay, thanks, bye. I really enjoyed the sachi. Maybe a bit too much. But how would it fare out there in the wild? All right, good evening, ladies. Hello. How's it going? Hi, good evening, sir. Sorry to bother you. Hey, good evening, ma'am. Sorry to disturb you. Got this new alcoholic beverage. I would like you ladies to give a go. Let me know how it, it tastes. Cheers. No cheers? Cheers. Ah. cheers. cheers. Wow. Yeah, very nice. Very nice? Yes. Do you like it? Yes. Quite good. Quite good? Not that um, strong in the uh, alcohol content, mm -hmm. I feel. It's coming. Very mild, yeah. yeah. Something yeah. like white wine, eh? White wine? Like white wine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite bland, quite easy to go down. Do you think this is wine? Maybe like yeah, cider. Actually, like cider? So I think it's more wine. Beer lah. Because it'll be a jeans, but a little bit lighter. What if I told you that this uh, was actually made using tofu waste water? Tofu waste water. But don't look like it. Doesn't, doesn't taste like it? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, oh. Interesting. <laughs> so you wouldn't order this uh, to get your buzz? No, I'm a bit beer person. Right? But what do you think about it? Would you drink, um, drink this again? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's nice to hear. You would uh, take this over your drink right now. Can I have Good more? Good to know. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll give you some more later on. Yeah. Will you still drink it? Yeah, it's very nice. It's still very yeah. nice. <laughs> okay. You can finish it. Okay. Can you sure? Yeah, you can yeah, finish it. Thank nice. you so much for your time. Indulging in a new drink once in a while is one thing. But are we really ready to embrace foods churned out by the labs as part of our daily diet? Can we truly know how healthy they are? If we think about it, all cooking is really a science. Apply heat to amino acids and simple sugars and you get browning, or the Maillard reaction, named after a French chemist in 1902. To prevent browning, ascorbic acid in lemon juice reacts with oxygen to stop oxidation. Freezing temperatures deactivate chemical enzymes and microorganism growth, allowing us to preserve food for much longer. We could see food made in a lab as an extension of that. But if I were to be honest, after a culinary journey involving bugs, algae, and waste water, I'm not sure if I have the stomach to try another food from the future. It tastes like very unsatisfying soy milk. Luckily, I've been granted a reprieve today. I'm at Kitchen by Food Rebel. Elika Tuska, a health coach and the owner of the restaurant, is my chef. And she promised to cook me a meal with what she calls real food. Apparently, even pasta doesn't cut it. I actually want to tell you the exact dish that we're going to cook. So we're going to do some zoodles. Have you heard of zoodles? Zoodles? Yeah. You know Singlish, right? 
Okay, yeah. so it's a bit like this. Zucchini and noodles together. Oh. The word is doodles. Yes. Noodles. <laughs> I know, right? Zucchini noodles, okay. Exactly. So that's exactly what we have here. This is yeah, zucchini. because we want to focus on real food. So we don't want to use spaghetti or pasta. We want to use noodles. Well, what's wrong with pasta? I mean, that's real food too, isn't it? Ah, uh, does anyone know of a plant called pasta plant? No. <laughs> but I can tell you I know a zucchini. Plant. But it's it's made from wheat, right? Like from yes. grain, isn't it yes. natural too? Yes, well you would think so, right? But wheat grain is a natural plant. Now to make pasta, think how many steps the wheat grain goes through to get the end result of pasta. That's the problem. I'm not sure, actually. A really good way to think of it is to think of what were your ancestors eating? We need to go back to our roots a little bit, but if we're adding preservatives, artificial bits, then it's not real food, then the end product. It's not real food. All of our digestive system, all of our organs, was designed to eat the human being's diet. I wonder how such a real food advocate would feel about the future foods that have been processed in a lab. So for me, in the future of food, it's, is it real food? And can we utilize the technology to make it easier, for example, for farmers mm. to help us produce real food? Okay, but what if these food options originated from the lab also? Because they have had to have testing, right? And that was probably done in a lab before yes. they rolled out and in mass production. Yes. What do you think about that? Well, look, I still think that the ones that we have created in a lab, the jury is still out on it. Something grown in a lab is not exactly the same as something that grows from nature. And what we're not necessarily looking at is the side effects elsewhere. We still need to give our body what it was designed to eat. How about the lab-grown meat, though? They claim that the meat that they grow in the labs, the original source was from the cow or the sheep. It is exactly the same, whatever atoms that make up meat, mm? exactly the same as if it was grown from an animal. Then if it's you exactly know. the same, yeah. why is it not grown as an animal? But sustainability issues, perhaps. Our traditional ways of food production cannot satisfy with the increase in demand of food. Globally. So the, the key thing there is, is that why not then eat the animal in a smaller quantity, swap the vitamins and the nutrients that we're trying to get from the animal to getting those vitamins and nutrients from something else mm -hmm. that comes from nature, which is Mother Nature can only provide so much, mm -hmm. so we're so, supposed to only take so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we need to change ourselves. Absolutely. Rather than using new ways of creating more things to satisfy ourselves. A absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be able to better see where Elika is coming from after I've had a taste of real food. So we're going to use zoodles and then on top a creamy mushroom sauce. I love brinjal. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get some of that eggplant inside there. Simple ingredients put together with a lot of flavour and at the end result is going to be a fantastic plant-based real food meal. So Josh, I really want you to try oh my this. Gosh, this looks so good. I'm gonna just take it in with my eyes first. And... Oh, it I lovely. love that you smell your food because with food, this is another enjoyment, like yeah. triggering all the senses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like you smell and then you look Visual. at it and then yeah. Okay, here goes zoodles. <laughs> my first ever zoodles. <laughs> Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> and you know, I love my noodles and my yeah. pasta yeah. al dente. Yeah. So this is perfect. Yes. That's that bite, that's the crunch That's so it. true, because mm. that is the best way for pasta to be al dente. Like literally to the tooth. And to have the zucchini have that texture is perfect. I would love to make zoodles like Elika. But the fact is, processed food, like canned food and instant noodles, have become a part of our diet for a long time now. When they first came on the market decades ago, they too were hailed as tech marvels for their long shelf life. But now, health experts are warning us to eat less of them. Will the latest wave of so-called sustainable food products, good for the planet, be bad for our health in the long run? Fortunately for us, nutritional science is far more advanced than it used to be. I'm bringing the cricket flour, the only testable product at this time, to Professor Christiani Jayakumar Henry. He is the director of the Clinical Nutrition Research Center. Hi, Prof. Hey, Josh. Good to see you. Good to see you. This. I want to find out how nutritious crickets really are. All 
All right, Prof, uh, let's get straight to it. What are the results from the test? So the results from the test of looking at the uh, insect protein, mm -hmm. crickets in particular, was that almost 50% of it was made of proteins, mm -hmm. to be precise, 49%, and about 20% fat, and to be precise, 19%. So overall, it's a pretty impressive appendage of interesting nutrients in this product. Right. Compared to our normal wheat flour, what, what, how does that compare? So wheat flour has only about 11% protein mm -hmm. and very little fat. Mm -hmm. So in terms of flour to flour, as you can see, the cricket flour has got much larger amount of protein and fat. Mm -hmm. But let's be quite clear, it's a bit of a uh, oxymoron to call uh, the, the cricket flour flour mm -hmm. because it's ground to a particulate. And in our vocabulary, flour normally comes from a cereal. So for today, we've only had the cricket flour to test, you know, and these tech companies want to guard their secrets very well because it's new. Sure, very good. But, you know, any food that is being purported to be marketed has to go through what's called novel food technology approval. Most countries around the world have regulatory mechanisms in operation. So, for example, in Singapore, our food is tightly controlled by the Singapore Food Agency. So, I think the consumer has to be, you know, allayed of saying we're not going to have Frankenstein food being fed to us. What we are now saying is that we need a second layer, which is how do we then harness the health benefits? Many of these food tech companies, you know, claim that their product is healthier than what's out there right now. So is there any robust research to show this? No, it's a short answer. The point we made was that cricket protein has got more protein than a beefsteak, and I think that's true. Where we lack data and evidence that what is the long-term consequence to health, we don't have any hard and fast data on 100% insect protein being eaten day in and day out. And that's, I think, the important point for the consumer to understand. We're talking about consistent, regular, and prolonged consumption. We don't know what is the long-term consequence. Do you think these food tech companies, they are really improving their technology for the benefit of the consumer and society as a whole? These companies were predicated on quick wins by venture capital going into these sort of product ranges. Mm -hmm. But even if you're a venture capitalist, you want to in the long term be a surviving capitalist. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to tell the consumer what is the added value. And I'm arguing that it's nutrition that will actually win the day. What are your predictions for the future? So I think my, my crystal ball of the future is that these are, are going to be unstoppable. Partly because, as I said to you, you know, in 20 years' time, we need to look at alternative sources of protein to match what we, what we currently have. There's incredible amount of venture capital coming into food technology. These are exciting times, incredible times. No parallel in human history. But at the same time, we're trying to ask the question, what are the health benefits? If they are good, bravo. Hello. Hi, how are you? Uh, can I have a signature, please? Thanks. Applying science and technology to our food production isn't new to mankind. But we are on the cusp of seeing an unprecedented wave of food innovations. Whether those advancements work for us or against us depends on how we deploy them. And through the choices we make as consumers, we have the power to nudge the technology towards solving the biggest challenges of our time, such as inequality, food security, and most of all, climate change. Because food isn't just about sustenance. It's also about culture, celebration, family, and friends, which we may not be able to enjoy if we don't innovate the way we produce and consume. And that's... Wine matters. Cheers to the new year, guys! Cheers! Happy New Year! <laughs> <laughs>